In the last part of this build series on this off-road buggy that I'm making, I thought I'd worked out the way that I wanted to use these Mazda RX-7 Series 6 hubs. I made the decision to use them upside down. A number of people then expressed to me the concerns that this was wrong and wouldn't work, but no one really told me why until at last somebody explained it to me and they talked about KPI, which is Kingpin Inclination. I was able to refer back to my suspension book and see what they were talking about. You'll notice that those pivoting points are not the same distance from the hub. It's not in a parallel line. In fact, it's quite marked. And even though this hub hasn't got kingpins, this angle here is what's called kingpin inclination. The hub is made so that one pivoting point is different to the other. Using these upside down has made the kingpin inclination round the wrong way. So instead of being like that, it's like this. The reason manufacturers put kingpin inclination in a hubs is so that as the suspension travels up, the bottom arm in effect becomes longer in its arc and pushes the, uh, the camber in. So if you push down on the front of the car, the wheels will go in at the top and you'll get more camber. Changing my hubs from being upside down has also meant that I've got to get new ball joints because the suspension and angle geometry of the ones that I've got won't work when I turn the hub up the other way. So I've had to go back to square one and go through eBay and find suspension joints again. I got lucky on the bottom joint. The first one that I picked out that is, might possibly work was this one out of a Toyota Corolla of all things. That'll go in there really well. It's easy to mount and that angle on the plate is just the sort of thing you need for a bottom book joint. That's going to work really well and when I fabricate, I'll fabricate slots for those two bolts. Putting the hubs up the right way also means I've got to redo this packing. Because if you look at the centre of the hub there, you'll see there's a height difference there. And so with that joint, uh, with the hub the right way up, this actually needs to be way up higher to get the centre line of the hub at the correct distance from the table floor uh, to be in full suspension travel. So I've got to redo this as well. And with these two studs, I've been able to drill a couple of holes in the block, so they'll just sit there. I've cut mounting plates for them, and although those holes will be slots so that I can move the bottom ball joint in and out for camber adjustment, um, I've decided to just leave them as holes and use the minimum position while I manufacture the wishbones. And you can see where I've left room on the plates for the wishbone tubes to come in and be welded on. This is a third hole I was talking about that I won't drill a hole for until I know exactly where this needs to go to get the correct camber. So that hole won't be drilled till a fair while away. What works for me when fabricating tube components on a build like this is to always cut my piece of pipe about an inch or 25 mil oversize. And to resist the temptation to trim the easy end first and to go and cut out the difficult end. So in this case, I've cut the slots so that this will fit the plate and I've hammered the ends down to make uh, for better welding onto the plate. Then once you get this end right, if you make a mistake, obviously you can work your way up the pipe a bit and get it right. Then when you get the difficult end right, you just trim off the easy end. So that now fits in there 
and I've done the front one. And thankfully I've got a bit of tubing from the first wishbones that I just fabricated but never welded up when I had the hubs up the wrong way. At least I've got that bit that'll work in there. So that lower wishbone is now fabricated and ready to be tack welded. There will be more steel going there to mount the shock onto but that'll happen later on. It's an entirely different kind of flying altogether. It's an entirely different kind of flying. Uh? One of my subscribers has asked me to show how I mark out tubing before I cut it by hand. This is fairly basic and I thought what I'd do is I'd, for the sake of demonstration purposes, upscale things so you can see them more clearly and use this PVC tubing. When you're joining two pieces of tubing of the same size and let's start with a 90 degree join because that's the easiest you're going to cut a recess like a semicircular recess equal to the radius of the pipe which means it's going to go to the middle of the pipe there so what I do if I'm going to cut the pipe is I mark it in line with the edge of the pipe the outside edge there and then I mark where this pipe on top lines up with the middle of that pipe. And that gives me the two points that I need. I also tend to put a line across the top and mark the top. Now what I can do is I can turn the pipe on its side and map out where the half circles need to go from. So I've got my furthest point and my shortest point. Once I've got the top mark and the top cut, what I like to do is transfer that mark up to the end of the pipe and go straight across the pipe and that gives me the bottom edge. And now I can do that exercise all over again. I've got my side marks there and I can pick up that point there for the middle of the pipe. If I was going to use a hole saw to cut this out, the end of the pipe that I've marked, which is equal to the middle of the one I'm joining to, gives me the, the point where the hole saw needs to be centred. But if I was cutting this out by hand and didn't have a hole saw, I'd cut across there and the other side, and then I'd put an angle cut in with the angle grinder like that, making two V cuts and then round it out with a hand tool. The other way you can mark the pipe once you've got those uh, points marked on the pipe where you want to cut it is to get an off cut of the pipe that you're going to cut to and mark it like that and that gives you a really good idea of the curve you've got to cut out however you're going to do. A 90 degree joint is obviously the easiest one to do. Well, what if you wanted to join this pipe to this at an angle like that. Well same thing again, I've got the middle of the pipe I want to join to marked. I mark the top surface of this pipe and go across and mark the end. So I've got the top and the bottom horizontal planes marked. I position my pipe where I want it to go. Let's say it's there. I mark this pipe where it crosses the outside edge of the pipe I'm joining to and I mark the middle of the pipe where it's in line with that there with the top of the pipe I'm joining to put those marks from that point to there now I can take this line down here and copy that around and then duplicate the cuts on the other side so you can see that this side is a fairly shallow cut and that one's a long deep one. I've cut my pipe out, like I said, you can see one cut's fairly shallow, the other one's extremely deep, whereas with a right angle cut, both sides are the same. That one's clearly not the same on both sides. And that's how it fits in. 
Really, the only difference between marking pipes of the same size that are going to join together so that you can cut them and marking pipes of unequal size is the radius of that curve. The radius of that curve is determined by the thickness of the pipe you're joining to. So in this case, that curve is going to be much more shallow. That's really the only difference. You can see the difference in the angles. Now I've cut the, the second pipe out. That's cut to go to a pipe of the same size and that's cut to go to a pipe of a much larger size. You can see the difference. That's a much more shallow cut and across the top is almost flat whereas that's got a bit of a curve to it. I hope that's been useful as I've shown you the methods I use to mark out steel tube and notch it by hand. And I hope it makes your work a little bit easier. Don't expect that you'll cut every piece of steel tubing at both ends perfectly every time. You're going to have failures. Um, I think you'll minimise them if you cut your pipe over length. Cut the most difficult end ang or angle first. And just accept the fact that you are sometimes going to have to cut things two or three times to get them to fit. The advantage in getting your joints well made like that before you weld is that your welding, whether you or somebody else is doing it, will be much easier and much stronger. And get yourself one of these for finishing off the cutting of your joints. An air tool with a round grinding bit. Can't live without this.